now pray very, very well. Almighty God, because without you we cannot please you, mercifully grant that in all things, and especially this evening as we come together electronically uh, to plan for our upcoming diocesan convention, your Holy Spirit might direct and rule our hearts. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Bishop. Because things are a little different this year, uh, let me see if I can help us get oriented first. The first question that would be asked is, will there be any questions, logically? And the answer is yes. If you will look on the format of the uh, screen that you have in front of you, there should be a question mark. If you hit the question mark, uh, you can type in a question, and it will be delivered here to Wesley, who is our a computer wizard and Wesley will hand it to me and you can ask a question at any time if it's of a technical nature he'll answer it immediately uh, if it's of a substantive uh, question we'll answer it as the evening evolves and if it requires further research we'll answer it and provide you with the answer directly and we'll provide uh, the answer to everyone else by posting it on the diocesan website so any and all questions will be acknowledged tonight and we will provide you with the answers uh, as quickly as humanly possible. Next, um, the question is uh, about the documents that would be attached to our considerations tonight. We are hopeful that you might have already looked at them. If you haven't, there's a little icon also on the screen in front of you that looks a little bit like a folder or a piece of legal paper folded with a little corner. And that little icon, if you hit it, it will give you access to everything that's on the diocesan website in the way of, of the materials that we'll be going through this evening. You can also access anything that occurs tonight. This will be posted on the diocesan website and you can come back to it at your leisure, including to the documents, and look at the same uh, as, you, as you wish. Uh, let's see. Now, if I can get us to look first at the brief overview of the convention, the format also will be different this year from years past. So uh, both in length and, of course, obviously the time of year. It will be in March instead of January to accommodate our uh, outstanding world-class speaker. The registration and check-in will begin on Thursday, March 23rd, Thursday, March 23rd, from 3 to 5 p.m., and will be at the Jacksonville Marriott on Salisbury Road, right off of the corner of JB, JTB and I-95. So uh, J. Turner Butler and I-95, and get off on uh, JTB and uh, head east, and the first almost immediate exit is Salisbury, and that is uh, where the hotel will be located, as per usual. The opening Eucharist will be at St. John's Cathedral on Thursday evening beginning at 7 p.m. Buses will be at the hotel for transportation and the buses for the priests will leave at 5.30 in order to give them time to vest at the cathedral. Bus buses for delegates and guests will leave at a more leisurely hour at 6 o'clock. Following the services, the buses will provide transportation back to the hotel and dinner will be on our own. Friday, March 24th, will be our day of conversation. There will be an early breakfast available at the hotel, and we will then travel to Episcopal School of Jacksonville in Arlington on the east side of the river for our day of conversation together. A continental breakfast will be available there for people who go directly to that site along with registration on that property. Our distinguished guest, the Right Reverend Richard Charters, Bishop of London, will give an opening address afterwards and breakout groups will form for discussion. The group discussions for the day will end with plenary reports. Following the day's activities, there will be a social hour, actually two social hours, back to the hotel where everyone will be released for a further dinner should that be necessary. The business meeting of the convention will be held on Saturday, March 25th, and will begin with breakfast at the Marriott, followed by our business meeting. We will convene at 9 a.m. and adjourn around lunch. 
Box lunches will be available for eating either there if our deliberations continue or if God is merciful to us with a timely adjournment, we can take them with us when we leave. And that would conclude the 174th Diocesan Convention. Voting procedures will be different this year. And I want to emphasize this, bring an internet accessible device. Please bring an internet accessible device. If you don't, we will have them available on the on the floor, but just bring your cell phone or your computer from home or something that can access the interstate if, or inter, internet. If you do that, that's how the voting will be conducted. We promise to make it as easy or easier than getting on Facebook to contact your children or grandchildren. It will be literally that easy. It will involve just a number that will be on <laughs> your credentials when you get it and that will give you access to voting and we'll take you through it in its entirety. The um, biographies have been provided uh, electronically and will be posted on the property on site in large screens and there will be limited numbers of printed versions available. But it should be very easy to do and we promise that every vote will be counted no matter how long or how hard it is to do it. Next, there will be resolutions to be considered a number of them. Every action of the convention is a resolution of some kind or another. We have three general convention resolutions from the 78th General Convention of the Episcopal Church, which are required to be read on first reading as referrals only. They are on the diocesan website and in the materials that have been provided to you. The first reading is a procedural requirement for further consideration and no action is required of the diocese at this time. They have to do with three areas. Uh, one appears as literally as to move one word around the word suffragan in bishop. Uh, one is, has to do with forming a new diocese and one has to do with conduct of business at a general convention. But again, no action will be required at this time. Next, nominations will be heard for a variety of offices and uh, uh, we will now have Reverend Sandy Tull come and join us and share that with us. Here. Good evening, everyone. The nominating committee, consisting of Ann Rowe, Ronnie Kelly, Jim Corbett, Father Tom Murray, and myself, present this slate of nominees to standing for election. Before I start that, I would like to also note that every region is well represented. From the river region, there are six people. From First Coast East, ten. From First Coast West, eight. And seven from Santa Fe and Appalachia. The committee thanks everyone who is standing for election. And the ballot is as follows. For deputy to general convention, we will elect five. The clergy nominees are the Reverend Wiley Ammons, the Reverend Ken and Allison DeFore, the Reverend Abby Moon, the very Reverend Kate Moorhead, the Reverend Tom Reeder, the Reverend Ken, Ken and Nancy Sulau, the Reverend Les Singleton, the Reverend Beth Choflat, and the Reverend Ken and Dr. David Widener. In the lay nominees, we will also elect five. And standing for election are J. Byron Green, Lenora Gregory, Ben Hill, Fred Koberlin, Debbie Melnick, Jim Salter, Jack Tull, and Margaret Wiles. For diocesan convention or diocesan council, we are to elect one clergy. The Reverend Jerry Smith is standing for election. The lay nominees, we will select two from Bruce Belmont, Courtney Carter, Bruce Hengecliff, Melanie Martin, Rhonda J. Masters, Sam Oliver, Jim Phillips, Hank Wilson, Ralph Yearwood. For disciplinary board, two clergy to be elected. Standing are the Reverend Ian McCarthy and the Reverend Celeste Tisdale. There is one lay nominee to be elected to disciplinary board, 
and standing for that is Byron Cawthorn. Standing committee. One to be elected from the following clergy, the Reverend Donovan Kane, the Reverend Michael Moore, the Reverend Tom Murray, the Reverend Tony Powell. We will elect one of the following lay nominees to standing committee. Linda Baker, Charlie Clark, Judy Shipman, Marcia Choflat. I would ask you if you have not gone to the website to please do so and view each of the nominees, look at their biographies, see why they're standing for the office that they are, and then if you have questions or concerns, please get in touch with them before you come to convention. Call them, write them, but somehow be in touch. And please come to convention prepared to vote. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. Next, we will be reviewing canonical changes, which will be presented by Mrs. Jill Dane, Chair of the Constitution and Canons Committee. She will be assisted by Jeff Hoffman, former Vice Chair of the Diocesan Council, who together with Bill Irwin, the current Vice Chair of the Diocesan Council, were uh, the committee that worked very, very hard on all of these proposed changes. And uh, Jeff is here to be with us also if there are substantive questions. So uh, I'll now turn this over to one of the best lawyers in Jacksonville, Joe Dan. Thank you. Uh, the Convention Committee on Charter and Canons has two basic sections to amend or present to you for consideration for amendment for this convention. The first section all relates to the Diocesan Council, and there are a number of six different canons that have reference to the Diocesan Council and its positions that we're recommending for amendment. This is all part of a review by the Diocesan Council as they looked at their role as overseer of the business affairs of the diocese and the governing body between conventions. Their effort is to make it a more efficient and effective board, just as many nonprofit organizations would have. So the primary substantive changes that you see before you, I hope you've studied them and used them as bedtime reading. The first canon change, and it's the largest um, substantive change, is to delete in its entirety from Canon 4, Section 5, the position of regional warden. Uh, you may or may not have noticed that we have not been electing the position of regional ward, warden for a number of years. And that is being replaced later in the canons with an additional at-large lay representative. So there will be five at-large representatives, but no one going by the position of regional canon. So canon four is section five deleted in its entirety. The next number of changes, um, Canon 5, Canon 6, Canon 7, and Canon 9 are really clarifying the positions and who has voice or vote, or vo voice and vote and seat at the council and the diocesan convention. So those are to clarify based on subsequent changes that we'll get to in, in Canon 10. Uh, they're fairly simple. The treasurer section is just being cleaned up to combine all their duties, so there's no substantive change in the duties. The main change is in Canon 10, and in Canon 10 we're breaking out very specifically the composition of the, of the diocesan council, listing each position with their role of seat, voice, and vote on the council. And you will note that it does change from four to five lay delegates at large, lay members at large, elected by the convention. The next substantive change in Canon 10 is in section three to increase the terms of the lay at large, or I'm sorry, of all the at large members from a two year term to a three year term. So they will have a longer period to serve. We're also providing that they will be staggered in their elections so that we won't be replacing a large number of, of council members at one time. We're also spelling out that the periods that folks serve 
for the regional canons, it's while they're a regional canon, they serve on the diocesan council. The secretary, the treasurer, the chancellor, and the president of the standing committee also serve for the period of time that they're fulfilling their position. Then the next change is to allow a successive term. Right now we have that there will not be successive terms and we are changing that to again provide a little more continuity as people come and go on the council. We're allowing them, if elected, to serve a successive term in these changes. The officers, we're just spelling out very clearly in Section 8 that the bishop is the chair of the diocesan council and that he will nominate and the council elect a vice chair within 30 days of convention. And the rest of the changes are again for clarity throughout Section A to insert the word diocesan council or diocesan convention to make it clear which we're talking about. The next major change is in subsection B, at the very last page, and any handout you're looking at are printed, and that's to align with the Constitution and Canons of the Episcopal Church. The Constitution and Canons of the Episcopal Church define members as those 16 years of age and older. Our reference for vestry qualifications specified that it was a person 18 years of age or older. This came before the convention last year and we withdrew it to do a little further research and study and we're bringing it back this year just removing the language 18 years of age or older. So for each church or parish you have the option if you desire to nominate slate uh, draw from a hat, however your parish selects vestry folks, someone that is as young as 16 years of age, which is the requirement of the Episcopal Church. And those are our only changes for tonight, if there are no questions that have come in. Great. We have no questions. I Thank love you. it. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Jill and Jeff. Great presentation. I enjoyed it. The best kind. <laughs> Well, let's see. It will now be time to move on to issues of the budget, which will be presented by two people. Uh, the Reverend George Hinchliffe will chair of the Common Ministry Budget Committee, will speak on the ratification and acceptance of the 2017 budget. As is our custom in the diocese, the 2017 budget was approved by the diocesan council. However, beforehand, the diocesan treasurer, Mr. Ben Hill, will present the 20. 16 budget report and we're also available for questions so gentlemen thank you ken and allison uh, as your treasurer uh, i've worked this past uh, year to facilitate effective communication between our professional staff our advisors our uh, volunteers on committees and the churches to provide uh, what i think is uh, essential transparency for the 25,000 people that we, we serve. Uh, I'd like to start out and just go over the balance sheet for last year for the, uh, the, the diocese. This does not include uh, the, uh, the foundation. It's the common uh, ministry budget and the uh, camp and conference center. So our assets uh, total 18,652,000 and change. Uh, our liabilities, 2613000 and our net assets, uh, 16 million and change. Uh, you, can, you can see these reports, so I don't, I don't think I need to spend a lot of time just reading numbers to you. Um, the majority of the, if you look on, on line nine, the majority of the accounts payable uh, is the retired clergy benefits. That's a, that's a large number there. Um, we do have notes payable. We do have uh, the old nativity property on Normandy that we do hold the mortgage to. I'd like to go uh, to, the, to, the, to the next, the uh, statement of support and expenses, the next chart that you might, you might look at. Uh, we ended the year with $1,933,000 in support from our churches. And as I said last year at convention, I thank you for your support and your generosity in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ across our diocese. We have 55 pledging units. Um, there was a shortfall of $159,000 between the 10% uh, tithe and the actual uh, receipts. Um, this year, 
the, good, the great news is that difference drops to $89,000 in 2017. Uh, as our churches, I think, realize it's a good investment to support the programs and the ministries. Um, so I, I, the, the, uh, the, the chart there that you're looking at, uh, 2015, we had a million eight eighty one in support, and our parish support is up to a million nine thirty three. So great news there. You see the total support three million five hundred eighty four thousand. Um, that uh, uh, I think the notable expense. Uh, that uh, shows an overage of budget is the support to the camp and conference center was more than we budgeted for and uh, staff and administrative here at the diocese was more uh, than we budgeted due to some personnel changes. Let's move on to the Nehemiah fund. Uh, I'm, you have uh, on your on your sheet you have the individual churches that you can you can look at uh, at your um, at your own time. Uh, the the Nehemiah fund the statement of income and expenses uh, you see that we have a total support uh, on the Nehemiah Fund is 285,910,000. Um, the total expenses 709,000. My numbers are just a little bit more accurate. Um, so we had a, a, a deficit of about 423,000. Um, the the um, common ministry budget support. Uh, that the Nehemiah Fund did contribute to funds, of course, the Bishop's Institute, the Campus Ministries, the Camp and Conference Center, and the other ministries that we continue to support. Uh, I, I will mention in real estate business, we successfully negotiated the extension of several of our leases uh, on properties that there is no immediate strategic need for them. Uh, we did close on the sale in Chattahoochee of the church at $31,000, which you see on the budget. And uh, we tried to get the Good Samaritan property to close in 2016. We missed it by a month, but uh, that'll be some good news uh, for 2017. Uh, if, if you look at the next chart, the Camp and Conference Center, we have total support uh, that uh, from, from income was $1,439,000. Our total expenses were 1439000 because we spent everything that we, uh, we took in. Um, notable that in 2016, we had diocesan programs of 416000 uh, That was slightly down from, from the year before. Uh, I think notable uh, improvements in the Camp Weed, uh, better management practices have showed significant savings in both the cost of food and our utilities. Um, it's expected moving forward that the support to the camp and conference center should decrease uh, from the common ministry budget as deferred maintenance is caught up and uh, when the acting director uh, wraps up his, his assignment. So in summary, uh, it's a pleasure to work with Bishop Howard as your treasurer. As always, if I can be of any help and uh, answer any questions, please contact me at uh, bhill at diocesefl.org. Uh, thanks, and I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Not quite. Oh, not quite. Uh, the only question of the night so the far? The only question of the night is a brief explanation for someone who was not familiar with the Nehemiah Fund. So, Good. Okay. The Nehemiah Fund is a fund that was established by our bishop. It is, uh, at, it is used at his discretion, uh, mainly uh, used for the support and building of new ministries, of ongoing ministries, uh, maintenance for some of the churches that are not able to um, to support their their, their uh, major projects. So that is basically a uh, a fund that we invest to generate proceeds to use for uh, extending our, our ministries. Uh, we do deposit into that fund the income that we receive from the church leases uh, and property sales. That's that's the basis of of that seed money. Uh, you'll see about $730,000 get uh, deposited into that in 2017 from the sale of our Blanding Boulevard property. Uh, and, and of course, I missed the important ones, and that's uh, evangelism and growth. Uh, planning new ministries, uh, which we do have some good news on. Uh, I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll find out more about that at convention. I hope that answered the question in a, in a short form. Thank you very much. And with that, we will uh, now hear from uh, the Reverend George Henschler, who is a real pro. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I have... Uh, 
bring you greetings from the Common Ministry Budget Committee. Uh, Lorette Scott of um, St. Michael's and All Angels in uh, Tallahassee, uh, Father Richard Pelkey of St. Joseph's in Newberry, uh, Father Joe Boyles, uh, St. Mary's Madison, uh, Matthew Green from San Jose, uh, Willard Kennedy from Grace Church, Orange Park, uh, and Ben Hill, who is with us every meeting. Thank you, Ben. Uh, we, uh, for the second year in a row, have approached the common ministry budget uh, with a little bit different approach, uh, looking at each of the ministries that are funded from the common ministry fund. Uh, and going out actually visiting each of them with a committee member doing an on-site visit and talking with uh, the program staff who are ministry staff who are on on site uh, looking at how the ministry's goals align with the diocesan goals particularly around evangelism and other things uh, trying to uh, reconcile uh, local support as well as Dawson support and see how we can better mesh the two. Uh, that was our approach for this year. Uh, and as you can see on the screen, um, I believe uh, there is a graph that um, gives you a distribution of the budget that was adopted in late January by the Dawson Council. Uh, it includes um, about 63% of the budget is for strengthening and supporting congregations. That's just a little over $2 million. That includes such things as uh, all of the activities that go on here at the um, uh, Dyson House. Uh, it includes the um, uh, regional uh, canon support. Uh, it includes congregational development uh, and um, the next, cat, next largest category uh, is the Ministries for Youth, uh, College, and Young Adults, uh, which is a little over half a million dollars. Uh, that's just the monies that are in the uh, Common Ministry budget, about 17% of the budget. Uh, again, just slightly under half a million dollars, 13% of the Common Ministry budget goes to support Mission Beyond Ourselves. Uh, that would be things like uh, Grace Mission in Tallahassee, uh, St. Mary's uh, here in Jacksonville, uh, Church with 